dive toss and similar techniques focus on improving the delivery of the munitions. A different approach, sometimes combined with the previous, involves modifying or creating ordnance capable of being guided onto the intended target. The history of guided munitions is surprisingly long and, for the sake of discussion, we will limit it to the type of ordnance used predominantly during the Cold War. Part 3. A different approach. Guided munitions. One of the first and most spectacular early example of the advantages of guided ordnance is the sinking of the battleship Roma on the 9th of September 1943, hit by manually steered, radio-controlled, 1,400 kilogram bombs called Fritz X. The Roma went down with circa 1,400 souls on board. The attack was preceded by the very first sinking of a naval vessel using guided munitions, the HMS Egret, on the 27th of August. These won't be the last, as many other British and American ships will follow in the next two years. At 1550, another PC 1400X bomb hit the left side of the battleship Roma, striking it amidships between the anti-aircraft turrets 9 and 11. The bomb passed through the hull and exploded underneath, flooding the boiler rooms and the aft engine rooms. The two starboard propellers stopped, the speed decreased below 16 knots from the initial 22, and the ship listed starboard. The speed continued to decrease. The Luftwaffe airplane piloted by Sergeant Kurt Steinborn released his Fritz X-bomb from 7,000 metres. After 42 seconds, the bomb guided by Sergeant Eugen Dagen struck the port listing ship's armoured deck, close to the armoured tower near the bow funnel, between the large calibre turret 2 and the mid-left 152-55 gun installation. The bomb exploded in the forward engine room and caused an initial large steam leak on top of a flood in the forward engine room. The 152mm ammunition depot on the port side exploded, together with the large calibre 381mm ammunition depot number 2. The large calibre turret number 2 was ejected 1,500 tonnes, like a spumante cork. From radio to TV... A remarkable piece of engineering developed by the US Navy in the 1960s is the AGM-62 Walleye. Rather than using tail flares to assist steering from the bomber, such as the 1940s Fritz X, the Walleye could be locked to a precise point via TV and released. The bomb would, autonomously, steer itself until impact. Besides the precision, the Walleye could be released several miles from the target increasing the safety of the crew. The crew moved the airplane in small increments as directed by the Wizzo until the target was exactly in the crosshairs. Then, by pulling the stick trigger, they commanded the optical tracker to go into a self-track mode. Next, they dropped the bomb and it guided itself to the target. All of this is much easier said than done. The main problem with the walleye was making sure it saw the target and not some other contrasting point within the small box or gate. A perfect target might be a black building in a snowfield. Unfortunately for the US Air Force and Navy pilots, there were never enough black buildings on snowfields to attack. Against a more typical target, the optical trackers fell victim to clutter, such as trees, bushes or other buildings, or billboards that the tracker might glom onto. Following the Navy innovations, the Air Force introduced the GBU-8 and later the GBU-15 in the 70s and the 80s. These weapons improved the original AGM-62 by increasing the payload, adding data link capability and more. In parallel, the US Navy updated their Walleye, eventually creating the Walleye 2. The problem with bombs is their reduced efficacy against tanks. In most cases, either a direct hit or a 900 kilogram bomb is required to ensure the target's destruction. The issue with the latter is that not many can be carried. Since the pre-2026 NATO's task was Russo-Soviet deterrence, with countless tanks expected to be targeted, this was a concern. Here is where someone had the idea of applying the TV guidance concept to a 200 plus kilogram air-to-ground missile equipped with a shape-charged warhead. The AGM-65 Maverick was born. 
The first crews to use Maverick in combat were the hand-picked Rivet Haste crews who flew the newest slatted wing F-4E to Udorn, Thailand, just in time for the start of Linebacker 2 in 1972. Captains Hugh Moreland and his Wizzo, Captain Ken Kenworthy, shot their first Maverick in combat at a truck on a road during Linebacker. The hit nearly vaporised the vehicle, and they flew home congratulating themselves on succeeding with one pass what might have taken several with dumb bombs. After they landed, however, their euphoria evaporated as quickly as the truck had. They got a severe ass chewing from their commander for shooting a $25,000 missile at a $500 truck. From magical lights to the stars. Another means of guiding ordnance born in the 1960s is the laser, acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The idea is to point a laser beam onto a target, thus painting it, whilst ordnance capable to detect and steer onto such laser is on its way. This concept has been applied since the Vietnam War to all sorts of weapons, thus making them intelligent. For example, from bombs to artillery shells, missiles and even unguided rockets, a more recent means of guiding ordnance is the VIA the Global Positioning System, or GPS. By inputting a precise set of coordinates, in fact, specific ordnance can steer autonomously onto the specified target. Besides the mentioned guidance means, several others are used, such as radar, infrared, and INS, although the latter is usually a co-steering method along the others. Part 4. Paving the Way in the late 1960s, the first laser ordnance and relative guiding devices were being developed. The ZOT was one of the very first devices used to steer the laser beam and thus the ordnance onto its expected target. The name as a curious origin, being it an onomatopoeic word associated with an anteater jolting its tongue in a comic strip. The ZOT had many shortcomings, first addressed by the pave knife, the pave knife was used to guide the first bombs as early as Operation Linebacker. An iconic event was the destruction of the Tan Hoa Bridge. This objective was attacked multiple times and hit repeatedly with heavy losses to the US attackers. In one occasion, a handful of obsolete MiG-17 bravely jumped on and engaged a force of over 70 F-105, F-100 and additional assets. Vastly outnumbered, they eventually managed to score a few kills with the help of AAA, whilst losing some of their fresco. This event is a demonstration of the bravery of all the pilots who fought in real life, no matter their side. For us military aviation enthusiasts, this is something worth remembering. From a gaming perspective instead, it is something that we would love to recreate in DCS but cannot, due to how the AI behaves. Back to the Than Hoa Bridge. Despite over 300 bombs falling near or onto it, it still stood. Eventually, it was later brought down by minor attacks conducted using innovative weapons, laser-guided and TV-guided bombs. These innovations impacted ground attack operations like few others throughout the short history of military aviation. In a short time, the term surgical strike bubbled up in Pentagon and media accounts of the war as LGBs dropped 13 more bridges in less than a month. Parenthesis. Big targets and small targets. The precision provided by laser-guided ordnance tangibly improved close air support operations. When friendly troops are in the proximity of a target about to be bombed, precision and safety are paramount. Target acquisition is the most significant problem in close air support, or CAS. Using conventional target acquisition aids during average daytime visual conditions, a fighter pilot on a 10 second final has less than a 50% chance of seeing a tank sized target by the time they close to 2000 feet slant range. Fighter pilots can subsequently acquire the laser spot, identify it as the target, and attack. Pilots can concentrate on rapid, accurate and effective attacks against designated targets without doubting validity. However, both facts and pilots must still consider the proximity of friendlies to the target. Another advantage of laser designation involves the capability of laser target acquisition systems to relieve the pilot from actually focusing on the specific target. 
In fact, they may not physically be able to see the target. Targets totally concealed by vegetation can be attacked on the first pass. Drawing a parallel to DCS, if you have ever conducted a CAS mission following nine-line briefings, you have almost certainly employed laser-guided munitions onto a target marked by a FAC-A or JTAC. The effect is usually as desired, with minimal issues in terms of unexpected damage. Now imagine dropping unguided bombs onto the same location. Can you match the same degree of precision, especially with the tools available in the 1970s? Pave Knife and the others. The previously mentioned Pave Knife was large and weighed 550 kilograms. It was carried under a wing station by the F-4 Phantom II. Its bulky appearance slowed down the F-4, but it provided a crucial improvement having the lacing device mounted on a gimbal turret. Along the pod, new guidance kits, easily screwable on Meg 80 series bombs, were introduced. As the knife hit the field, the work on a further improved variant was already going. The new pave pod was called Spike and landed in the mid-70s. The first immediately apparent improvements are the new shape and size reduction, halving the weight of the pod to circa 210 kilograms, the paved spike, in fact, could be carried in one of the recessed wells normally holding the AIM-7 Sparrow, thus freeing one of the bomb-holding stations. The compact package and weight decreased the impact on the Phantom II's maneuverability and performance. The paved spike, despite being limited to good weather and daylight operations, had noticeable success. Beyond US service, it was used by Royal Air Force Blackburn Buccaneers during Operation Desert Storm to paint targets for the Panavia Tornado and other assets. Following the PAVE spike, at the dawn of the 80s, the PAVE TAC was introduced. Mounted on the centerline pylon, the TAC was bulkier and much heavier, circa 630 kilograms, three times as much as the PAVE spike. These characteristics made it less loved by the F-4E crews. It had, however, an undeniable advantage. It had an infrared imaging unit, enabling the usage of the paved TAC in bad weather or night. The TAC found greener pastures in the belly of the F-111 Aardvark. This much bigger aeroplane could carry it in a semi-recessed station in its bomb bay, thus minimizing the massive drag it caused when mounted on the Phantom. Fast forward to the mid to late 80s, a new pair of pods entered service, the Lantern Navigation and Targeting Pods. Feature-wise, it expanded the already noticeable capabilities of the PaveTac, taking full advantage of the technological innovations of the digital revolution to provide higher definition, precision, and capabilities in a vastly smaller package. The Lantern is especially known for enabling the transformation of the F-14 Tomcat from an analog de facto obsolete fighter in the post-Cold War years into a remarkable air-to-ground asset that shined in all the conflicts until its retirement in 2006. In the years that followed, or along the lantern, multiple pods were introduced in different countries. For example, the British TIALD or the Israeli Lightning, made by Raphael ADS. The latter will later be joined by Northrop Grumman to create the Lightning 2 and 3. Another example is the French Damocles, produced by Thales. Back to DCS and conclusions. In DCS, a number of pods are available, although many of the modern ones suffer from exceeding quality and precision, according to crews I spoke to, or such characteristics are mixed up. Two noticeable exceptions are heat blurs, pave spike and lantern, made for the F4E Phantom II and the F-14 Tomcat. Since I spoke extensively of the Lantern in the last few years already, the subject of further chapters will be the Pave Spike pod carried by the F-4E Phantom II. Thanks for watching and take care.